month of October, it is Pastor Appreciation Month, where uh, we take time to um, appreciate our pastor. I appreciate him and Sister Glenna all year long, but we don't want to just say, hey, we appreciate you. <laughs> we want to um, do something to appreciate them. So um, just start thinking about something that you can do for Brother Les and Sister Glenda to show them that you do appreciate them this month. And um, if you need some ideas, I know if you're like me, not regarding them, but sometimes I just need some ideas for um, if somebody asks me to do something. But next Sunday there will be a little insert in your bulletin that will give you some ideas if you need something. Um, but go ahead and start thinking of some ways that you can show them that we appreciate them all the work that they do for us because it's more than just getting up here on Sunday mornings. We know that. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff they do. And we love y'all. We appreciate you. Alright, if you'll stand with us.
Oh 
rhetorical question because I know we all can know the power in that name. How many of you have called on that name? And he has been there. The word says the name of the Lord is a strong power. The righteous run to it and they are saved. I, I can testify to that. We don't read a fairy tale when we open that Bible. It is the true and living word of God. You can take him at his word. And if he says you can call on that name and that things will happen, they will. Jesus, what a beautiful name.
Jesus, 
let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We've been focusing for the last few weeks on the I am statements that Jesus made. I remember I was at uh, lunch with a colleague of mine, a business colleague, and uh, he had retired from working for one of our major universities. And uh, maybe I shouldn't name it, but the initials are D-U-K-E. <laughs> I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> and uh, he had retired, and because he had retired from working for the university, um, not in an education capacity, but he, you know, the university's pretty big, um, but he worked in an administrative capacity. Because of that, he was allowed to go to school for free, free tuition. So he decided to further his education and go to uh, School of Divinity. And uh, so he was learning quite a bit. I've never been to the School of Divinity, okay? I'm not a college education, educated uh, seminarian. That, that's not my background. Um, but he was getting some background. And one of the things he shared with me at lunch that he learned was that, you know, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. Other people said it about him, but he didn't say it. And I'm like, <laughs> I wanted to say it. What book are you reading? What book are you reading? And they may be teaching you something in class, but I think this book is more important than what some professor has to say. Can you say amen? amen. I'm not against education. I think education is a great thing. Uh, but if you, anybody here like reading? I love to read. I love to read. And sometimes you read a book and, and you say, what were they thinking? What, you know, what are they really trying to say in this book? And, uh, one of the greatest ways to find out what somebody's trying to say when they wrote a book, Cody, is to talk to the author. Wouldn't that be good? We can talk to the author. The Spirit of God can reveal to us what he's trying to say in this book. So Jesus was talking about himself. So he made some I am statements. We need to be reminded about who Jesus said he is. He said, for example, we talked about I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. Today we're going to be in John, the 11th chapter and I want you to let the Word of God speak to you this morning. Our text scripture today comes from John eleven twenty five. 25. It says this, Jesus said to her, we'll get to a moment who that was. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You just take that one scripture out of the Bible and it probably won't make a whole lot of sense. What do you mean you're the resurrection? You're the life. Who do you think you are, Jesus? He knows who he is. Somebody believes in you even though he's dead, he's still going to live? That doesn't make much sense. Especially to people who don't believe in Jesus. You know what the Bible says? The carnal mind cannot perceive the things of God because they are spiritual. They are spiritual. Now, the context of this verse helps us understand what Jesus was saying and why. And I want to encourage you. You've heard this before. Read this book. Read this book. Study this book. Many of us know a lot that's in the Bible, but it's very important to study the context of scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us and give us a clear understanding of truth. That's, that's what he does. That's how he reveals it to us. He's trying to help us understand what, he, what is written. When you read John eleven twenty five, 25, it should prompt some questions. That's how I study the Bible. I read something and I say, for example, it said Jesus said to her, who is her? Inquiring minds want to know. I want to know who he's talking to. Why is he talking about being the resurrection of life? What does he mean when he says, whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall I live? How did what he say apply to the circumstances he was facing? What else did he say during that time? Was he responding to a specific question or event? What divine truth was he teaching? And maybe most importantly, what does this mean to me today? Why do I care? Why do I care? What does this mean to me? The Bible is a loaded book. When you read it and you study the scripture, remember the purpose of this book is to help us understand the nature of God. Who is he? What is he all about? What is he like? And here we have a wonderful example of Jesus telling us directly, this is who I am. I am the resurrection and the life. So let's put it in context. John 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill. 
Lazarus of Bethany. So we know the man's name. We know where he lived. It was Bethany. That was the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So now the story begins to build. We got a sick man, Lazarus. We got two women who are sisters, Mary and Martha. What do they have to do with Lazarus? We'll find out. Verse 2 tells us about Mary. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Remember that story? That's the Mary that we're talking about. It was Mary who, who worshipped the Lord in that way. Broke the expensive ointment and, and cleaned his dirty, nasty feet and wiped them with her hair. It was Mary, whose sister was Martha, and it was Mary whose brother Lazarus was ill. So we find out that this, these are siblings, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Verse 3. So the sisters sent to him, remember we just heard Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, talking about Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. In other words, so it's obvious, it's obvious that Lazarus and Jesus knew each other. It's obvious that they had some kind of interaction. Uh, it's obvious that Mary knew who Jesus was. She had worshipped at his feet. And so they sent to Jesus. They say, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, I just wonder if there's anybody here who's ever prayed like that. Has, is there anyone here who's ever had someone you love that is sick? Can I see your hand? I think that's everybody. Keep them up. You ever, if you prayed for them, leave it up. You ever prayed for somebody you love that's ill? And maybe you prayed like me. Maybe you prayed like me. You put your hands down. Maybe you prayed like me and you said, Lord, help them. This is, this is one of your servants. This is somebody that you love. This is what's happening here. The sisters, Mary and Martha, they were concerned about their brother. Sister Annie, that's the way it ought to be. They ought to be concerned about each other. So these two sisters were concerned about their brother. <laughs> you want to know why, Sister Glenna? I'm glad you said yes. <laughs> oh, Lord, help your pastor. See, if it had been Martha who was sick, then uh, she, it might have been okay, because between Martha and Mary, they take care of everything. <laughs> but when the men get sick sometimes, <laughs> oh my goodness, should I go there? Probably not, somebody said. I, I saw a picture, I think it was on Facebook. And somebody said, if a woman has triplets and then she has a kidney stone on the same day, passes a kidney stone, she'll have a small idea of what it's like to a man when he has a cold. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's not in my notes. That's all right. But see, that's, those are the kinds of things I think about when I read the scripture. The sisters were concerned about it. Now, we're going to find out it was really worse than that. He didn't have a cold. In fact, who knows? They might have said to him, come on, let's get up. Get up. You're not that bad. And he said, I, I really am, sis. I really am. You know, maybe he, he was like the boy who cried wolf. You know, he was always wanting his sisters to take care of him. But this time it was really bad. In fact, when the word got to Jesus, think about that. The sisters sent to him. What did they do? Mary Jo, did they send him a text message? Facebook message? Contact him on Instagram? Email? Yell phone? How did they get word to him? I want to know. Now, now, this is one of those things I think when I get to heaven, I'd like to ask, but I really want it won't matter then. But I just wonder, how did they get word to him? And, and how, how long did it take? How did that communication take place? But somehow or other, if you believe the word of God, they sent to him saying, Lord, he, who, he whom you love is ill. Now, did the message get to Jesus? Yes, it did. Because look at verse 4. Sister Glenna gave us verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, so he got the message, here's what he said. This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, isn't that an interesting response? Jesus didn't say he wasn't sick. 
There are some people who tell you, don't, don't claim that sickness. You know, you're coughing, your nose is running, you got a fever. And somebody said, don't say you're sick. Say, I don't have to say I'm sick. Look, look at me, you know, look at me. He didn't say he wasn't sick, but he said this illness does not lead to death. Isn't that interesting? I believe Jesus always told the truth. What an encouraging response. This illness does not lead to death. Now that would be an encouraging response, I think. It is for the glory of God. You mean someone can be sick and the reason that person is sick is so that God can receive glory? It happened there, didn't it? God has no respect of persons. It could happen to me. <laughs> wow. It's a little personal note. When Glenn and I were sitting in our van and just come out of the doctor's office, the doctor said, there's something terrible wrong. I think I know what it is. He said, but I'm not going to tell you. We'll wait to see what the surgeon says. And so, you know, we, we, had, a, we, we had a bad feeling. We knew something serious was wrong. And so we got in the car, I took her hand, and the first words out of my mouth was, thank you, Jesus. We want you to be glorified in our lives. That's the most important thing, more important than anything else. Did we pray for healing? Absolutely, we pray for healing. Did we trust God for healing? Yes, we did. Uh, did, did, we, did we hurt? Was it painful? Yes, it was. But the most important thing was to bring glory to God. Jesus said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Every one of us, I think, can relate to these circumstances that these sisters found themselves in. One you love is sick. Jesus said this was for the glory of God. So, what did Jesus do next? He heard that somebody was sick. He said, it's not going to lead to death. Here's his response. He, he got the message. Verse 5 and 6. Now, Jesus loved. I want you to hear this. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. She loved, he loved them. That's what the Bible says. You can believe it, say amen. He loved them. Now you may say, well, if he loved them, then he should have got down there right away. Do it now, Lord. My brother's sick. We need your help. Do it now. Respond now. But that's not what happened. Jesus loved them. Let me, let me show you how much he loved them. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he, where he was. Now, to me, that's an incredible part of this story. Lazarus was sick, so sick, I know I made light of it, but he was so sick that his sisters were crying out to the Lord for help. They were desperate. It suggests to me they couldn't get any help anywhere else. They probably tried all the home remedies. Maybe they'd been to Walgreens and got a prescription filled. Maybe they'd been to the doc in the box, the urgent care. I don't know what they'd done, but they were desperate, and they needed Jesus. Jesus loved them, the Bible says. He loved Mary, he loved Martha, he loved Lazarus. And so he waited. He just waited. He stayed two days long in the place where he was. Some people will say he did nothing. He just waited. He loved them, but he waited. Are you hearing that today? Here's something I want you to get in your spirit today. Just because it doesn't seem Jesus is responding, that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. You hear that this morning? The Lord wanted somebody to hear that. Or maybe he wanted all of us to hear it. Just because it doesn't seem like Jesus is responding, that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. That's what the enemy says. You've got a need. You called out to Jesus. It seems like he's doing nothing. So the enemy says he doesn't love you, doesn't care. He doesn't care. Don't let the devil twist that in your mind. Because he loves us. Can you say amen? He loves us. He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And what he did was he waited. He waited. I want to talk for a minute about some dead ends. Dead ends. I-N-S. Not dead ends like a dead end street. Some dead ends. There's three characters in this John 11 story I want to mention. Thomas, Mary, and Martha. Each of them were dead in their own way. And it's in this context that Jesus reveals and declares that he's the resurrection of life. I asked you earlier, we need to look and say, why did Jesus feel he had to say, I'm the resurrection and the life? Well, here are some dead ends to watch out for in our own lives. 
Some of you have heard the name Pastor Craig Rochelle. He pastors a mega church in Oklahoma City. And when he was preaching about this topic, he pointed out these three, three dead ends I want to share with you. The first one is Thomas. Thomas has a nickname nowadays. Anybody know what it is? Daddy, how would you like to be famous for that? I doubt it. The Lord said he was going to die, resurrect, and somebody said they saw him, and I doubt it. That's just all we, a lot of times that's all we know about Thomas. But if you study the entire chapter of John 11, you'll see that Jesus told his disciples they should go to Judea again. His followers were concerned because of the Jews in that area were looking to stone Jesus. Thomas was dead in his doubts. We can be dead in our doubts. Thomas obviously had a uh, doubting, maybe a critical mind. Maybe he was from the Missouri part of, of Israel. Anybody know what Missouri's uh, slogan is? The show me state. <laughs> show me. Show me. But listen, when they had this discussion about going to Judea, the Jews were looking to stone Jesus. Here's what John eleven sixteen says. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Get us also, let us also go, that we may die with him. So we hear all about his doubt that Thomas had, but he also had some confidence. Anybody here ever had any spiritual doubts? That happens sometimes. And we're especially susceptible to spiritual doubts when things don't go the way we think they should go. Because a lot of times, let's be honest, the, the way we pray is we try to tell God what to do. It's just a natural way to pray. We tend to be a little bossy in our prayers. It's like the guy who wrote the book. He's, he's, if I told you his name, you'd recognize it. He's famous, a famous Christian minister, and he wrote a book, and the title is Write Your Own Ticket with God. I didn't read the book because I don't believe that's the way it works. I don't believe we write our own ticket with God. I believe we can be honest with him and tell him, Lord, this is what we think needs to happen, but we have to trust him and put, put ourselves in his will. If you haven't ever had any doubts, then go ahead and let people polish your halo. Okay, but I have had doubts. Thomas had a problem with being dead in his doubts, but he was also getting ready to be made alive when he witnessed the revelation and the resurrection power of Jesus. You know, when we get to heaven... I wonder if it's going to be this way. I mean, we're going to be there forever, right? You believe, we'll believe we'll be eternally there? That means we'll have all the time in the world. So Roman, one of these days, I'd like to go meet Thomas. Some guy comes up to me, he says, Hey, I'm, I'm Thomas. I'll say, Let's hear him. Doubting Thomas? <laughs> well, I wonder how many years he might say, Hey, what would you have done? That's what Thomas might say. What would you have done? Would you have believed? Would you have believed? Let's talk about Mary being dead in your discouragement. Remember, the sisters had called for Jesus, and Jesus waited two days. Verse 20. So when, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. Martha went and met him. You know what Mary did? She remained, she remained seated in the house. She was discouraged. She might have been upset. Now don't say amen if you've ever been upset at the Lord. <laughs> but most of us know how that feels. We've been, we've been just discouraged. Let me ask you a question. Have you, have you ever been discouraged? Sometimes we're discouraged with the Lord's response to us. Because we say, like the sister said, our brother Lazarus is sick. And his response was certainly not what Mary thought it should be. She was discouraged. She remained in the house. How about this? You ever been discouraged and really didn't know why? You're just discouraged. You can't really put your finger on it. Don't you think Mary had a valid reason to be discouraged? Some people say, of course she could be discouraged. She was discouraged. Her brother was sick. And if you know the story, now he was dead. That's what happened. Now, what I wonder is, did the word really get back? Did Jesus' response get back to him? Did he just tell the people that were around him, it's not unto death? Or did the word get back to him? I really don't know for sure. But what I do know is in between the time the sister said, you have to come, he's sick, and the time Jesus showed up two days later, 
In the meantime, Lazarus was dead. So imagine Mary, she's sitting in the house instead of going to meet him because maybe she's thinking, now Jesus is coming. What good is that going to do? Things haven't worked out the way I think they should. Should I still hope? Should I still pray? How about this? Things aren't working out the way I think they should. Should I still come to church and worship with others? Should I still serve the Lord? Oh, God, help us. God, help us. Let's talk about Martha. Dead in your delays. John eleven twenty one. 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So who's she blaming it on? Hey, hey, Lord, you had a chance, Lord. If you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever experienced a delay while waiting for God to answer your prayers? Amen. Sure we have. Because it's just human nature. We want everything and we want it now. But God has perfect timing. We do not have perfect timing. We, we, we really don't. But God does. And if we really believe God is who he says he is, we'll have some trust and confidence in him. We've all experienced delay. Here's another truth I want you to take home with you, and that is God's delays are not God's denials. Just because we don't get the answer when we want the answer, that doesn't mean the answer is no. Sometimes when we pray, I believe God always answers my prayers. Sometimes I believe he says yes. I believe sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. Sometimes he says, have you lost your mind? <laughs> you know, some of my prayers. You've got to be kidding me. But God's delays are not God's denials. Because listen to what Martha says. First she said, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But listen to what she goes on to say. John eleven twenty two. 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. That is some faith. That is some recognition of who Jesus is. We asked you to come. You delayed. I know if you'd been here, I know you would not have died. But even, even now, even now. So see, that's how we need to pray. You know, we're praying, and, and we're praying, and we're praying. And we're saying, oh God, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? And the enemy tries to mess with our minds that says it hasn't happened yet, it won't happen. But you know what? There can be an even now, an even now point in time. Here's how I pray for people that are lost. Some people will watch this later online somewhere. And if you're lost, here's my prayer. That the Spirit of God will continue to draw you while there is still time. That's how I pray. Because that Spirit can draw and then all of a sudden, even now, I mean, haven't you seen it before? Somebody who needs Jesus, and they're fighting Jesus, they're running away from Jesus, and then there is that moment, that just small moment of surrender, because the Lord is saying, come, come, come. And, and the, the enemy says, well, the Lord is way out. Oh, no, 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 he's an ever-present help. I mean, he's right there in front of you, and you just have to take a small step of faith. Sometimes all it takes is for you to say, Jesus. So I challenge you, the next time you just feel like I just can't handle anything else, or I, this, is just, this is just driving me up the wall, just say, Jesus. Jesus. The next time somebody's in your face, <laughs> one of those sandpaper people. Roman, you know what a sandpaper person is? They rub you the wrong way. <laughs> you, 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 you run into one of those people, rub you the wrong way? Maybe you just need to stop instead of doing this confrontation. Just say, Jesus. How about this? Somebody says something. If you're on social media, they say something. And you think, oh, ooh, I can't believe they, uh, uh, I just got to say something. Maybe you should just pray for that person. How about that? Call on Jesus. Because you can't change somebody's heart. But God can. Even now. So as she said, she said, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. John 11, 23, 24 says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, 
I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. I sense a little frustration going on there. Now I've led you up to our text scripture. This is why Jesus said what he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Because Lazarus was sick. He was so that God could be glorified. Jesus loved them so much he waited so God could be glorified. And there was some confusion. There was some discouragement. There was some doubt going on. And then Martha says, I know you can do anything. And uh, Jesus said, hey, he's, he's going to rise again. She said, oh, I know that. <laughs> you know, I can almost sense her emotion saying, great, but I mean, that, that doesn't help us now. Verse 25. I think there's a 25, 26. I don't know if it says that, Glenna. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. This is why he said it. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believe in me, believes in me, shall never die. And Jesus says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? You see, people that don't know Jesus are dead inside. Dead inside. People that believe in Jesus, Jesus is coming to your heart then you have spiritual life. He has come to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. And what he promises us is eternal life. You will never die. Remember what he said to the woman at the well? <clears throat> that woman that the men wouldn't even have, have uh, lowered themselves to speak to. This woman who had been divorced and remarried several times. This woman that was getting water at a time where no one else was there because even the women of the village didn't want anything to do with her. But Jesus reached out to her. He said, I've got some water you can drink of. You'll never thirst again. Living water. Living water. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he asked, do you believe this? Here's the thing, church. The resurrection is not just an event. If you die before the Lord comes back again, we're going to be resurrected, right? We're, we're going to meet him in the air, right? That's what's going to happen. How is it going to happen? I, I have no idea how that works. But I believe it because the word says it. The resurrection, though, is not just an event. It's a person. Jesus didn't say, I'm able to resurrect. He said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. That's who he is. He is the re resurrection in life. He gives life to dead things. Dead things in their life. Verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be what? An odor. For he's been dead four days. I think the, the King James says, he stinketh. <laughs> he stinketh. Jesus said to her, isn't that, isn't that interesting? Jesus said, I am the resurrection. <laughs> Take away the stone. She said, oh, I don't know if you want to do that, Lord. It's going to smell pretty bad around here. You know what it's going to smell like? Death. Because it felt like death and disease. Because I don't think he, he didn't have an injury. That's not what it says. He was ill. There was some sickness. He was so sick, that sickness took his life. So that smell was death and disease, perhaps even decay. Jesus said to her in verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? Verse 41. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father... I thank you that you have heard me. Verse 42, I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. <clears throat> when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. He said, Lazarus, come out. Verse 44, the man who had died, not the man who had never died, and they just wrapped him up dead and put him in there. He was dead. Dead as a, a doorknob. wonder where that expression came from. <laughs> but he was dead, wasn't he? The man who was dead came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Can you imagine that? They rolled the stone away. The resurrection of the life says, come on, come forth, come out. You know what, I, I, just, I just love to wonder about things when I, when I read the scripture. You know what I wonder about, Sue? How did he get up? If you're tired, <laughs> if you're tied, if you're tied up, you know, now listen to what it says, though. 
The man who died clean out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. So I wonder, I wonder, Simba, did he, did he, did he walk out? <laughs> or, Kelly, did he do the worm? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. Was it loose enough that he could kind of, was, was he on a ledge, you know, that he could kind of, you know, fall? And get, I don't know. I don't know. But I know one thing. He was wrapped up. He was alive. But he was wrapped up and constrained. Because he'd been involved with death and disease. This world had tried to destroy him. But he was alive. Some Christians are that way. They're alive. Jesus is in their heart. But they let the enemy just wrap them up. He, he had, in fact, he had this, his hands and his feet were bound with the linen strips. His face wrapped with a cloth. Which means he probably was trying to, couldn't see clearly. And as amazing as that is, isn't that amazing? Say amen. You think that was amazing to Mary and Martha? What about the other people standing there? No, that's not what's amazing. You know who was really amazed? Lazarus. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a little example. When I had surgery on the 7th of last month, I remember walking into the emergency room. I was carrying my IV bags. Because Ron, we got ready to go from one room to the other. The lady had a clipboard and some other stuff. I said, can I carry something? She looked at me like she probably doesn't usually get that question. She said, yeah, you want to take these two bags? I almost said no, <laughs> but I didn't. I took them, so I walked in there, and I remember getting on the, you know, getting situated on the, on the table and, and telling a joke before I, before I went under. Because <laughs> they said, we're giving you something to make you relax a little bit. And I said, did you say you're giving me something to relax? She said, yeah, you feel it? I said, I think, I think I'm feeling it. Wait, I, I got to tell you a joke. And as far as I know, I told the joke. I hope I got to the punchline. But the next thing I remember, I was in a recliner or chair of some sort in another room, Betty. And I asked Ron, because Ron used to work at ORs. I said, Ron, how did I get there? He said, you walked. <laughs> I mean, you'd think you would remember that, right? Uh, Ron said, no, you walked. They, they, they. I said, how? I said, did I say something? He said, probably. You know. I'm walking and talking, don't realize. But, but when you wake up, when you're, when you're in one situation and then you wake up, I mean, you ever been there? Anybody ever had surgery and you had that experience? You wake up and you think, whoa. Imagine being dead. And the next thing you know, your eyes come open. And you say, the clouds. Dirty, stinky clouds. Cover my face. Can't move my hands and feet. If you're claustrophobic like me, maybe, maybe he went squirming out of there. He wanted to get out of there. But he came out of there and Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Let him go. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Maybe you've been rescued by the Lord, but you're still wrapped up in things of death. Dead thinking, dead doubts, dead discouragement, dead delays. I want to remind you that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He asked this question. He said, do you believe? Do you believe? That's a question for this world. I read something recently, and um, they said that the Christians in China have been able to manage through persecution because they know when they become believers, they're going to be persecuted. They prepare for it. Christians in America, we better start preparing. We better start preparing. Because we have, if I can use the term, have enjoyed a certain amount of tolerance historically. People have tolerated and, and you know, in fact, sometimes even esteemed Christian beliefs. But things are changing. Things are changing. Tolerance for Christian beliefs is eroding. And who knows how quickly it can happen. So here's a question we're going to have to answer as time goes on. A very simple question, and that is, do you believe? Do you believe? That same voice that called Lazarus out is calling us today. So do you believe that even now, God can work a miracle? Are you doubting? 
discouraged, maybe you're in the middle of a delay, could this morning be your even now moment? Would you stand? What am I expecting? I don't know what they were expecting. She said, Jesus, even now you can ask God for anything and he'll do it. But I don't know what she was expecting. Maybe she was saying, if you've just been here, because I know God would answer your prayer. And then he said, he's going to come back to life. Uh, I know, eventually, you know, in the end. Jesus said, no, I am the resurrection and the life. So what am I expecting? I'm expecting that God will be glorified. I'm expecting God to be glorified in the way he wants to be glorified and in the time that he pleases. It's all according to his time schedule all according to his plan. I have no doubt that many of you are praying. You have, some of you have desperate prayer needs. I want to encourage you to trust God for those. Say, God, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. And I want you to hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, do you believe? Do you believe? I can do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done. You just have to have faith in me. Because we need to confess, church, we don't know what's best. I confess, I'll tell you, I don't know what's best. I got my own ideas, but the longer I serve the Lord, the more I begin to realize that, you know, the Lord has a plan. The Lord has a plan. And if we're not careful, we'll let what people do discourage us. But we need to remind ourselves, God has a plan. As a matter of fact, you look in this book, He's got a plan. All the things we're going through now are just... Just like a wisp. Just temporary. But one day, one day, if we're faithful, and having done all, stand. We stand, and having done all, stand. We'll be in the presence of the Lord. His name is Jesus. Jesus. I surrender, I give up. 
I give up. It's, it's, it's nothing I can do to change this. It's not in my control. Oh, God. As we can say, like the sister said, Lord, you can, you can do anything. You can do anything. So we trust you, God. We trust you, God. Lord, I thank you for your word. Your word is powerful. Your word feeds us. Lord, I just trust you. You knew who would be here today to hear this. You knew who would be listening to this later on. So, Lord, for every heart that needed to hear, you say, I am the resurrection and the life. We believe in you. We'll live and not die. Oh, God, you asked the question, do you believe? And my answer is yes. Yes, I believe, Jesus. I believe and I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray you do a miracle right now that you would change someone's heart. Someone that is discouraged, that you would encourage them. Oh, God, someone that is sad and lonely, that you fill their heart with peace. It's a peace that passes understanding. We don't understand how we can have peace in the midst of our turmoil. That's because it's a supernatural peace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, there's something about your name, Jesus. We call on your name. We say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's just something. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord. You be blessed in Jesus' name.